Hello, good morning, welcome. Um, welcome to the EJU online roundtable, uh, Women in European Judo. And um, my name is Jane Bridge. I'm a vice president of the EJU um, responsible for education. And uh, when I think that only 40 years ago, I participated in the first ever judo world championship for women and only 20 years ago women's judo was officially included in the olympic games both substantially later than men's inclusion in the same events um, you know, men for world championships was 1956 and olympic games 1964. anyway a lot has happened since and we can witness in the sporting arena a good representation of female judoka who can compete under the same conditions as their male counterpart. Still in their minority, coaches and referees are represented by some women. And recently we have seen women nominated as head coaches, not only for women's team, but also for men's teams. Indeed, on the sports side, women seem to be making their way slowly, but hopefully surely. And those women that hold these positions serve as role models for an inspiration for other women. However, as Sander will explain, females are far from well represented in other areas of the judo community. Now, there is a worldwide push and there has been for some time for females to be represented in all areas of responsibility. We here are concerned, of course, with the judo environment, the place where we feel at home. However, the workforce should reflect and represent society. And if it doesn't, then it isn't maximizing the potential that is out there. It's been stood on studied and proven that a mixed environment of both men and women in, is much more productive and contributes to a well-balanced, healthier environment to work in. We can all contribute in creating a better balance of female representation within the judo community. And this forum is a way of sharing good practices and inspiring women and men to create a more balanced environment for all. So before we go to our first speaker, um, for the participants, for the listeners, please uh, remember you can ask her questions. We have a special place, question and answers. Please write in some questions and who would you like to answer the questions? And then Carmen at the end will help me um, choose the, the questions and direct them. So now um, to our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sander Korac from Croatia. Uh, Sander has been president of the Croatian Judo F Federation since 2005, vice president of Croatian Olympic Committee since 2017. In 2016, she was awarded with the Achievements Diploma Women in Sport by IOC President Thomas Bach. She is a member of the IDF uh, Gen Gender Equality Commission. Uh, she was also elected on the Executive Board of the IGF this year. So congratulations for this. And also, Sandra, congratulations to you and your team. Uh, you achieved the first ever world uh, championship title and it went to Barbara Matic uh, this year in Budapest so congratulations I also want to add that uh, Sandra is a fantastic woman to work with very inspirational hardworking, and also always great for advice so I leave you in the capable hands of Sandra Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you Jane uh, this is really great thank you for your introduction Quite a lot of my functions really uh, is responsibility uh, on my shoulders. But uh, just to say good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
I'm glad uh, and thank you, AGU, for organizing this roundtable. I think this is really important that we speak about uh, gender equality in judo. But uh, before the slides, I just uh, wanted uh, to share with you my story. As Jane said, said, I became a president of the Croatian Judo Federation in 2005. Uh, it is because two men supported me and they are working with me today. This is our general secretary and vice president of the Croatian Judo Federation. And from 2005 until today, we are working as a team. And I would say that this is the reason for our success as a federation. But I just wanted to highlight something else that in 2005, when I attended AGU Congress, I noticed uh, one uh, women uh, besides me, and it, it was at the time, I think, uh, president of the Norway uh, Judo Federation. And of course, time passed, and we are now in 2021, and we have in Europe uh, three president of Judo Federations, of course, plus Jane. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in 16 years, I would say nothing too much really, really changed. But okay, let's let's start uh, with the presentation uh, because Jane uh, made. Uh, we can start with the next slide. As Jane explained a little bit about the history of uh, women path in judo, of course that we have uh, different reasons, and uh, it it was. Uh, a gap between 64 and 92 Olympic Games. And this is, of course, one of the reasons that we are lagging behind uh, men in judo. But we also have to be, uh, I would say, grateful uh, to men that uh, led uh, judo uh, community and judo movement around the world, as now judo is among the sports uh, that are really equal uh, when you look at the, at the athletes, uh, on tatami, uh, we have gender equality. Rules, prize money, uh, joint competitions, now mixed teams and so on. So this is uh, really, I would say, really inspiring. But besides this competitor's population, women are really underrepresented in all other areas. So uh, look at the statistics. As I work as a researcher, I always like to rely on statistics. So what statistics show, show us is that, please uh, give me the table. You can see here, when you look, coaches, referees, national EC members, members of national federations, commissions, and so on, we are just uh, on the average with the, with the world. So I say I expected a little bit more from Europe, especially when you look at the, at the last row, general secretaries and presidents. Of course, this is data from 2019, 20, so before COVID time. We had in Europe four general secretaries and three presidents. And if we look how many uh, members AGU has, I think uh, it is 53 national judo federations. So 53 uh, uh, multiplied by two, this is uh, 106 possible positions and only seven of these are really occupied uh, by, by women. So uh, in, in uh, decision-making in judo, women are really underrepresented. So what, what we are really missing, what is really going, going on? Uh, in my experience, in the last five, 10 years, gender equality is really kind of hot topic. There are many conferences, many Erasmus and other projects, but it is really with a little impact. You know, the small projects kind of passed, nobody really took care about what is going on. And, and I would say that this is really kind of a problem. I'm. Uh, conducted uh, uh, for a few times uh, research, not only in judo, but also uh, in other sports as well, uh, from the position of uh, vice president of the Croatian Olympic Committee. 
And it is usual that the role of women within the family is kind of a main barrier. Women just do not have time to be included in, in a sports when they, once when they start a family. So kind of retaining uh, 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 women in judo should be one of the first tasks of uh, national federations, but not only national federations, clubs as well. And then of course, there are some other barriers like sufficient, insufficient support, lack of self-confidence. Uh, we do not have, if we have only few women, we do not have really role models and the media representation is really very low. I don't know how, uh, how the situation is in other countries, but in Croatia, this is really very, very low. We also have to be aware uh, that uh, 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 we are in different positions from club to, to, to regional, to, to national, to international uh, position and the level. Priorities should be different and are different national and even international uh, uh, organizations such as AGU, IGF, they could not put the position, uh, women in a decision-making positions if the women really do not have experience on a, on a local level. So I would say that this is very important to motivate clubs to do more than they are doing now. Okay, we can go on. There are many areas of improvements. Uh, there are now uh, many uh, I, examples of, of uh, good practice and we have to look and to exchange experiences uh, on projects that really may, made the difference. But we still do not have even enough information on some uh, of the important issues like what are benefits of women to be involved in the decision making. Also, when we are speaking about education and mentoring, uh, what about education? How to educate women? Uh, uh, does this depend on the, on the position of women, on, on previous education and so on? What about mentoring? We are speaking about the mentoring, but it is hard job. I know I'm mentoring uh, now one uh, young lady, young leader that is not in judo now for two years. And I think uh, we, we made quite the progress, but it is really a commitment and it is not easy. Of course, networking. Uh, men are used to have special networks. Women also do not have time and, not, and networking is not, not really going on. And it is also very difficult to even start something without quota. So I am really grateful that IGF now made strong recommendations to national judo federations to have at least 25% uh, of women at the executive committees. But this is not, not easy. So to conclude, gender, and I'm always highlighting that gender equality is a human right. It is one of the basic values of Olympism. And it is also a core principle of good governance. You know, if we have a teamwork, then it is kind of very natural to have men and women working, working together. Uh, for those who are really, who would really like to make changes, there are now many strategic documents that the national federations could rely on from UN general, uh, generation equality to EU documents. And at the moment, I'm also uh, among the working group on EU level uh, so we are working on an action plan uh, for European, uh, European Commission, uh, how to make a progress and how to monitor a progress on European level in sports. So uh, as I'm sure that many of you participated on a conferences, so walk the talk is message from many conferences. So again, uh, I would li like to finish that it is really important that we act. You know, wherever we work, in a club, in a federation, uh, just try uh, to support women. And as I said, we need, in judo, we need men to support men, but you also need women to support other women. And uh, I would really like that in European judo, we uh, can make progress and not to see progress in 100 years. Okay, thank you.
Mm. Okay, thank you, Sandra. <laughs> uh, we will, we're yeah. trying. We will. You're try. trying. Uh, and uh, I, I've already taken this point before, but I think it's so important that it's about including men in the process. Of course. You know? And of I course. think when it's just women pushing for women, you know, sometimes you can get a label of whatever. So it's really important. It's Jane, as I said, we need men to support women. Yes, yes, yes. To support other women. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Both. So, so thank you so much, uh, Sandra, for that. No um, so, our next uh, guest and um, is Rowena Birch from Great Britain. And I must admit, um, Rowena, I had to check a lot of the letters. Rowena has a lot of letters behind her name. I had to check. I didn't uh know what a lot of them were okay o l y behind somebody's name means she's an olympian so uh, rowena um participated in the olympic games in atlanta in 1996 and actually we were there together because i was coach to the british team at at, at the time and rowena came seventh in the olympic games so Rowena also has an MBA, which is a Master in Business Administration. She has an MEng, which is a Master's Degree in Engineering. Maybe you don't say it like that, but anyway, she has a BSc, which is a Bachelor of Science. She has a DIP PFS, which is a Diploma in Financial Planning. So um, I had to write this all down and check it all. But um, now, besides all these wonderful diplomas, Rowena is a sixth dan in judo. She was European champion in 1994 and bronze medal in 1995. She was Commonwealth champion, of course, she's from Britain. In 1998 and 1992, she had a bronze medal in the Paris tournament, which is now the Grand Slam in 1992. And she was British champion uh 1988 and 1997 she is currently a president a vice president of the british judo association and she is a self-employed financial advisor so if you have some finances and you don't know how to manage them then rowena is the lady for you and um rowena very kindly um agreed to give and come uh, some give up some of her precious time to speak to us about her wealth of experience. So Rowena, please. Thank you, Jane. Can, can you see me okay? Okay. What a uh, introduction. Um, I'm a bit taken back really. But to start off with, I want to make it very clear, I love judo. When I put on my judo suit, I feel comfortable, I feel safe, I feel confident. I almost wanted to wear it today. I love the big ippon, the excitement of it, the beauty of it. I'm at home in the dojo. The smell of the sweat, the quiet noise and discipline of the hard work. And the Japanese language that we use in the etiquette helps bring us all together and communicate no matter where we're from, whatever country, we, whatever language we speak. So for me, I've not really come across many barriers in judo for my career as an athlete, a coach, a board member of British judo and now vice president. So perhaps I'm the wrong person to ask what we need to change. I love our sport and I love the way we do things. But actually what we need to do if we want more women, we don't necessarily want more women like me, but we more want to find out how do we attract more women who perhaps aren't like me. So we need maybe some fresh eyes to look at it. Now I'm working now in financial services and equally in that industry, the women are highly underrepresented. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about an initiative that was done within that sector um, that actually increased the women's participate, um, yeah, women's recruitment, it was, from around sort of 25% to actually achieving over 50% for the first time. So I first 
got involved in speaking to somebody from a wealth management company, a big wealth management company, because I was looking for sponsorship for a project that I was running to support elite athletes when they retire from competition and they're transitioning to new careers. I needed some funding for it. And once I was in conversation with the head of the academy for this big wealth, um, wealth management company, he suddenly turned to me and said, have you ever thought of being a financial advisor? No. For me, it's just not me. I couldn't relate to it. I thought, what about, I'm not a financial advisor. Do I look like this? Well, then he looked a bit perplexed and he said, well, I know what, why don't we get you to come and critique our open days? And then you could probably tell us through your eyes what you see and what you think we might need to change if we want to attract more people like you. So I did. Went along to the first open day and it was held at the academy and I walked into this room. There were shiny desks, all in lines facing the front, set up like a classroom. There was a sea of blue suits and men, young men, and I felt really, really uncomfortable as I took my seat. Out the front, we got speakers. They were generally gray haired men um, using their PowerPoint. And I slowly started to disengage. Rowena, Rowena, can you answer this question? Talk about feel like a rabbit in headlights. It was my worst nightmare. They'd been talking in a language that I barely understood. And now I was put on the spot, my lack of knowledge of the industry totally exposed. It was awful feeling. So leaving that open day, I thought, right, I said I'd give them some feedback. I might as well be honest about it. I told them about how I felt very alien in that formal environment, how my worst fear was realized of of, of being shown up from my lack of knowledge. And also there was nobody in that room like me. There was nobody at the front speaking and there was nobody within the room that I got to talk to. I didn't get to talk to many people as it was because it was so formal, but there was nobody that I thought, actually, I can relate to these people. I said, if you want to attract people like me, you need to change what you're doing and address those things. Well, a couple of months later, I got an invitation through the post for an open day and I was delighted it looks like fun women's gin tasting and open day okay let's have a look at this so I went along to the little bar where it was held and when I walked in there was this sea of women we had time to talk and mix and um actually they were all, all from different backgrounds and I soon realized actually these women weren't so different to me we had speakers from women who had changed their career and who were now financial advisors. And they talked about things about how the work fitted around their family life, how it fitted around their stage in their life and what they wanted to do. And that kind of resonated with me. We had a lovely relaxed evening later, um, hearing from some three sisters who'd set, a, set up a gin making company and enjoyed tasting together and sharing those gins. I think what I gained most from is sitting with and talking with these other women. We had similar fears and we were able to share them informally and ask questions. They weren't so different to me. And I started to think if they can do it, perhaps I can do it. And then we started to jeer each other on. I'll tell you what, if you do it, I'll do it. Three months later, I started training to be a financial advisor. So what do we learn from this for judo? Do our environments alienate the people we want to attract? How do we address their fears? And are there people visible that they can relate to, that are like them? We need fresh eyes to look at what we do. We understand the yes of why you might want to be involved in judo in some of these roles, but do we actually understand the why no? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rowena. Wonderful. From, from the heart. From the heart. And I do take away one thing, Rowena, women's gin tasting sessions. <laughs> <laughs>
absolutely. And I can really um, uh, recognize some of those situations. I mean, for those who've been to, you know, congresses, whether it's the IJF, EJU, it's kind of this kind of stern, big guys uh, who are there sitting, you know, um, um, so it is quite intimidating, can be for small ladies. So absolutely, absolutely fresh eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rowena, for that. So um, our next uh, speaker is Mr. Driton Kuka, sometimes called Tony Kuka, who is from uh, Kosovo. Um, now, before he became coach to the very successful Kosovo judo team, uh, and in particular the women's team, and hence why he is, um, we uh, invited him. Tony was, or Mr. Kuka was, um, part of the uh, Yugoslavian national team. Um, from the minims to the seniors, he was a champion for Yugoslavia. And unfortunately, in 1999, he had to stop his career because of the war in Kosovo, and he became coach to the very, which is now very successful Kosovo team, and in particular, um, the, the women's team. And um, he said he would only um, give us a list of the European world and Olympic medals. And the list is very, very long of which I cannot uh, mention, but I thought I should mention in particular, um, 2016, which was the Rio Olympics, and it was the first ever participation participation in the Olympics of Kosovo, and the only two um, athletes from Kosovo that were qualified for the Olympic Games was Malinda Kel Kelmendi in 52 kilos and Nora Jakova in 57 kilos, and um, as we know, uh, Melinda Kelmendi went on to win. Um, the Olympic uh, gold medal for Kosovo. So not only the first ever participation in the Olympic Games, but then um, coming out with a gold, gold medal. And uh, Mr. Cooker, of course, was the coach to this team. So we asked him to speak about his experience and how he thought he was able to entice ladies into the sport and keep them into sport. And then of course, to, to make them uh, successful. Hello from Kosovo. My name is Driton Kuka. I'm national coach of Judo Federation of Kosovo. And I'm happy that you choose me to be a part of an online conference on gender equality. And I will share my experiences regarding some things, some strategy which I use first to get girls in Judo and after that, um, how to keep them. Because uh, I think that it's uh, much harder to keep them in sport than to get them. Because all kids in the beginning of their life, uh, let's say they are all pushed from the parents, from the friends, and so on to go in some sport and uh, most of them they start to do some sport but uh, after that um, the main problem is to how to keep them and after the war finished in Kosovo I get a really good generation of kids and I get all kids near my street and also from my street because uh, let's say that uh, my Linda's generations, they all live near our dojo and we build a dojo in our private property. Me and my brothers, we all do judo. And uh, all the kids which I got was kids who live uh, not far than 200 meters from this dojo. So uh, kids from one street and today the team which i managed to build one of the best in the world especially women's uh, they all came from the from my neighbor so uh, and most of them of course girls today i have uh, five athletes qualified for olympic games four of them are girls and my experiences how to keep them in sport was through traveling 
I was thinking when I was young what I, I loved as a kid. And I said, okay, I, I wanted as a kid to travel. I wanted to go in good places to make friendship and to know people from um, other culture, other countries. And I started, let's say, two, three weeks after the, I get the kids in club. I buy for, for all of them a uh, judo gi. And I send them in immediately in Sarajevo, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It, from my city, let's say, five, six hours. Uh, driving by car and was really good because if you ask today my Linda why did you stay why did you love judo she she will say okay I was after two three weeks in Sarajevo and was great having fun with kids from other uh, countries and uh, she was just nine year old so was really good for her and for for also for others and when I saw that they used to ask me many times when we should go in some other tournaments and also getting medals for them was very good, very important. Of course, the tournaments was um, for kids and not with a um, high level, of course. But uh, anyway, uh, they feel them good because they became a heroes in, in their families, in their uh, near their friends in school and in street and so on so this was um, let's say small strategy to uh, to keep to keep them in um, in judo and dedication of the girls is um, really uh, to make a big results is really big i think bigger than boys in my case so uh, this is what was my experiences and now uh, in this time of technology, let's say, it's not very easy to get them to um, do judo after the war in Kosovo. There was no iPhones and this kind of technology. So I think it was much easier to get them in judo. And now is a big fight. Now we have to do a lot of things and uh, making a lot of uh, games, making a lot of uh, strategies. To, to get them in judo and also after that the big challenge is to 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 keep them so i think those are my some small uh, experiences which i share with you regarding the um, women in judo and um, my experiences to get them to keep them and to make them uh, one of the best uh, judokas in the world and today I'm really happy that I managed to do that and um, I hope my experiences will help uh, some coach or some um, some uh, clubs federations to have more girls and to keep them in judo and also to achieve a uh, high level results thank you Okay, so um, as you can see, Mr. Mr. Cooker was is very busy um, with his Olympic preparation, so he very kindly uh, recorded. Uh, so again, something to take home is build your dojo in a strategic street. <laughs> very important. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, next we have uh, two speakers from Sweden. So we have Dr. Jesper Fundberg, who has been described uh, as one of the best Scandinavian experts in gender equity, diversity, and leadership in sports. And Christina Pecola, who is president of the Swedish Judo Federation. Uh, for the past six years, Dr. Fundberg has made successful results together with the Swedish Judo Federation. And uh, Christina took up the initiative 11 years ago with a small team to create a roadmap for the Swedish judo called Vision 2020. And guidance and tools were built from the experience from her civil work as a sports psychologist. Um, I'd like to send a quick personal message because uh, we've been collaborating with the Swedish Judo Fed Federation for about five years. 
uh, and uh, congratulations again on the um, results of the World Championships in Budapest. This time, the men's team with a silver and a bronze medal, really fantastic. And I think it really reflects um, the hard work of a united team. So congratulations, Christine, on that. And uh, Christina and Jesper. Thank you, Jane, and thank you to you all. And all the con congratulations should go to all the club coaches in Sweden because it's so amazing what we have learned the last 10 years is the importance of working together. We are so strongly together. I would like to share this uh, fairy tale, actually, because um, we started like 10 years ago or 12 years ago. Swedish judo was a dis dysfunctional family. We had a lot of uh, uh, people who behaved very much as the direction of corruption. There were a lot of power games, uh, actually very bad leadership. And we were, few of us decided, should we stay in Swedish judo or should we go? And as we know, Jigoro Kano with his code of conduct, we decided to stay. And you can see the results here. We started 2012 with the, uh, the first priority is how can we work with good governance in every day, wherever we go in Swedish judo. So thanks to the club coaches and leaders, we set up together a roadmap called Vision 2020. And as you see, the results was very bad 2012, the quantitative target goals. We were like 14,000 members. We were losing a lot of women. Uh, a lot of clubs, they just put down their um, activities. We have four educations. So when we decided at the annual meeting 2012 and set a target, well, 2020, we should be 20,000 members, 2,000 more women, 200 clubs, four, uh, 20 education and two Olympic medals. And all the people at the annual meeting said, well, if you're crazy enough and believe in this, we will vote for you. And you see the results now, 2021. It's amazing because already 2017, three, five years later, we had increased 6,000 members in five years. And that's very rare in Swedish sports federations. And that's the hard work our club coaches and leaders has done. So I, I just give all the applause to our committed coaches out in the country. So we started to think, how, how can we attract more young leaders? And we are talking about women and men, because the first three years we started to educate women, but we realized that that's not enough. So we started to have educations in gender diversity for all all young generations. And you can see here are some of the success factors I have written down that you have to be very brave and have a lot of patience because change takes time. And we started to look at the old structures because the way of how we organize Swedish judo, we had about 10 different commissions. And in those commissions, there was always a a man who's been there for 15 or 25 years. And you know, in sports, you can't kick them out because it's about inclusion. So we actually had the courage to change the way how we organize our federation. And instead of having commissions, we started to work in project form. So you know when the project starts and when it's end. And if there's a good persons with right attitude and doers, then we give them the possibility to continue with another project. What we also did is the financial, for the clubs, we tried to give finances for those projects, which, which went in the direction for the Vision 2020. And I can say, it's not easy. You have to be patient, but you also can see when you see the results that actually change matters and the diversity matters. So we, we realized that we didn't have the competence. So that was 2015 with 
made contact with the University of Malmo and Jesper Fundberg and Marlin Rönblom from Kasta University to teach us in the board federation, what is it? How do we work better with diversity and inclusion? And that's been amazing work those years we have been in contact. So Jesper will tell you a little bit more about later. So why should we work with diversity? I can tell you those many years I've been at the Federation Board is that actually we have much, much better finances when we have a lot of better diversity, more young leaders who are committed in the Federation activities and the culture. Actually, the culture is more about respect. Uh, as Jane mentioned about the IGF cocktail parties, still it's, it's a special world and I'm so happy to acknowledge our my male colleagues in Swedish judo that we don't have that kind of culture anymore what I experienced like 25 years ago. So we have said we have to hire right attitude who the people who wants to go and aim good governance and we have always had the moral code the conduct of judo is to remember and remind coaches and our athletes and board members that work with the moral code because that's so strong if you compare to other sports in sports world. Just to show you the picture, how it looks like now, if you see the picture on the left, that was like 10 years ago when we have a Dan grade examination, you can see there are about six men and one woman. And if you take the next picture, it looks like this today. We are aiming whatever kind of federation activities we have, it should be 50-50, 50% men and 50% women. And this is our young, our federation leadership meeting every January and take the next book picture. And what you can see, there's so much more diversity now. So thank you. And I leave to my special favorite doctor, Jesper Fundby. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, and thank you for the invitation for this roundtable session. Uh, I'm very impressed of all of your experience and, and medals and the career in the judo. I never entered the judoka, but uh, I believe I have some other experience and knowledge. Uh, that's, that's why we have uh, worked together for so many years. I will say something about the strategies and measures for a successful implementation of gender equality and diversity in the Swedish judo. Uh, in our joint, as a researcher working together with the national board, analysis of, of how the Swedish judo association has implemented their ambition of promoting gender equality and diversity in Swedish judo, we have uh, highlighted a number of important aspects. Uh, to begin with, um, that the national leadership took a firm decision regarding these issues, emphasizing both that they are, are important, but not least why this is the case. The need to increase the number of participant members and make them want to stay. Everyone should feel welcomed into the world of judo. Here, we believe that the core values of judo played an important role. The next step was to realize that this goal does not just mean to increase the number of women, but that there is also a need of changing men and men's behavior. That there is a reason why women are a minority and why women to a large extent than men decides to stop training judo. That it is men's behavior that is the main problem that it is the responsibility of men to change men. Here, support is crucial. Support that includes knowledge on gender and either the other dimension of power and privilege. I have, for example, worked strategically uh, with a group of men in order to support them in both seeing the behavior of their own and other men, as well as together with them, finding strategies for change. Thus, it is crucial to create possibilities for collective learning as well as continuously increase knowledge on racism, sexism, homophobia, and other societal 
power relations. To understand how power works in a subtle way as everyday races and everyday sexes. Here, I believe that the collaborative work between the researcher and the Swedish Youth Association has been crucial. It is also important to realize that this kind of change takes time. The decision to work seriously with gender equality and diversity was made 15 years ago or 12 years ago, and now we see that things are changing. Patience is important as well as realizing that change does not come easy. Resistance will also occur, and this work will never be finished. It needs to be constantly addressed. And finally, to act as a collective, to act together, not least for the top management. When a decision is made, the leadership stands united. If someone cannot take this, they need to leave space, space for others. In other words, there is no place for making acceptations for old tradition in the association. Change includes all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the Swedish team. And um, I'm always uh, impressed by um, in Sweden by attitudes um, to open attitudes to improve to uh, encompass all. I think you're very modern, forward uh, thinking uh, nation in, in, in general. So um, probably this also reflects somehow within the judo community. But of course, as you say, it depends on the leader and working together. So uh, thank you, very, very interesting. Just, just to tell you, Jane, that that's the problem we have in Sweden, that everybody in Europe thinks that Sweden is so democratic and equal, but it's so much behind and um, behind the doors. And we have been working hard and you have to have courage. Because as CSP say, we have met resistance. And there are men who are just 30 years old. They're not the older, 70 years. It's like you have to be very strong together. And it's not that easy as many think that there is a difference in Germany and Sweden, but it seems like Sweden there should be easier, but it's not. <laughs> so you can do it, but it takes time and you have to be very strong when it's when it's really hard days, but we can do it together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so to our last guest, last but not least, Mike, uh, is Dr. Mike Callan from Great Britain. Um, okay, so Mike, is, Mike Callan is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, Sport and Geography and head of the iDojo International Judo Research Unit at the University of Herefordshire. Um, he has extensive experience of providing coach education and consultancy around the world. He is the president of the International Association of Judo Researchers, education director of the Commonwealth Judo Association and managing director of the Judo Space Educational Institute. He has worked uh, in the International um, Federation Services team for Judo at the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics and will be traveling out soon to Tokyo. Uh, Mike, I think that's right, uh, um, as part of the technical team for the 2020 Olympic Games. Um, his PhD uh, relates to support for Judo players in an educational environment. He is a seventh dan and was awarded the International Judo Federation Special Awards for his services to education and research. So welcome, Mike. And uh, I won't forget to mention that we were also training partners uh, building up to the Women's World Championships uh, in 1980. Um, the, the British ladies team were all training down in Hounslow where Mike was training and uh, Mike being a lightweight and a good judoka was a fantastic training partner for the women's team so I'm sure you felt part of the success in that at that time so um, thank you for accepting the invitation and uh, over to you Mike. Thanks Jane for that uh, 
fantastic um fantastic welcome uh really appreciate it uh let me just uh, move this over um hopefully uh everyone can can see the the presentation um i'd just like to thank jane very much indeed for the uh for the um invitation to to speak today and and congratulate the other panelists on on all of their work um, and I did take a little sneak uh, peek at the uh, attendees and I see there's lots of uh, friends and, and colleagues and, and famous judoka in the audience so you know um, thank you to everyone for, for attending. Um, uh, I suppose I'm uh, perhaps probably because I had the, the privilege to be able to train with, with um, the team that Jane was part of um, a very special time in, in the development of women's judo. That, that's perhaps why um, I'm very keen to be a, a male advocate for the development of, uh, of, of female judo. And, and so that's partly why I'm, I'm very pleased to be invited to speak today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, develop, uh, women in judo within the academic literature. Um, what we're doing today is uh, is known in Japanese as a kogi. It's one of the uh, ways of, of studying judo, which includes uh, um, uh, conversation and, and randori and, and kata and so on. Um, and a kogi is a is a lecture. Um, and of course, the the character ko from kogi is the same ko that we find in the uh, in the name of the the kodokan. So I think what we're doing today in 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 creating lectures to share knowledge about judo is really uh, important and, and goes right back um, probably to the first judo conference for women which was held at the Kodokan in, in August 1926 um, and in that year the Kodokan built a special dojo for women um, and the uh, first uh, formal classes had started three years earlier so I think um, what Jane's doing here today is, is part of a, a long and serious tradition um, and um, I think it was perhaps uh, five or six years later that the Kodakan Research Unit uh, started um, their research topics, uh, one of which was, was Judo for Women. Um, but as Sandra uh, pointed out earlier, perhaps, um, perhaps progress hasn't been made as, <laughs> as much as we might have hoped uh, since then. Anyway, I'm going to just kind of um, point you to some of the uh, women's Judo literature and yeah, since the 30s and probably more recently, there's been a, a huge amount of, of um, judo literature uh, focusing on, on um, women's judo experience and, and uh, you know, technical matters and, and so on, um, particularly uh, influential in the, in the uh, history of women's judo, of course, is uh, Keiko Fukuda-sensei. And... Um, uh, this is a really important book. If you're interested in women's judo and you haven't read Born for the Map, please, please uh, go and, uh, and try and source yourself a copy. And, th and that literature comes right up to, to modern day. Um, Dr. Kanakogi talking about her, her mother, uh, Rusty, um, who uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honoured to have known. And um, please, please, please buy um, Jean Kanakogi's book if, if, you, if you can. Um, but then we see similar literature coming up in, in Japan. Um, there's all of uh, uh, Noriko Mizuguchi Sensei's uh, book on, on uh, women and judo. And there's a, a pun there in the, in the title. Uh, the characters also mean uh, sex and softness. So uh, it's an interesting book. Um, and then uh, other uh, technical books, for example, by Ryo Kotani and uh, biographies of Rusty Kanakogi in, in Japanese as well. And then we, in Japanese popular culture, we see, uh, for example, the Yawara-chan um, uh, manga series from the 1990s. If you're not familiar with uh, Yawara, Miss Yawara Inakuma, um, she is known as a, a fashionable judo girl and uh, it's a great manga series to watch and, and you can watch it on YouTube as well as an anime. Um, but more recently, uh, Joshi Judo Bu Monogatari, which is the story of, of women's judo, is a, is a popular manga you can, you can buy at the moment. Um, there's uh, Nagataro, uh, Hayashi Nagataro. She's, um, she's a, a, a bit of a bully, actually. So she 
you know, doesn't necessarily uh, embody all of the characteristics we'd like to see in our in our heroines. Um, and then there's, uh, of course, uh, Ippon again um, uh, with the uh, judo girls. So we've seen judo, women in judo throughout the, the literature over, over a number of years. Um, I'm, I'm privileged to work with Professor Elizabeth Pike. She's a colleague of, of mine and um, she's uh, globally renowned in, in women's sports leadership work. She's doing a lot of work at the moment with the International Olympic Committee. Um, uh, on the women's sports leadership programs. Um, and she uh, edits a, a book series, Women's Sport and Physical Activity, which is published um, by Routledge, a, a serious academic publisher, and uh, three, three books already in that series. And she approached me a couple of years ago to see if I would work on a book on women in judo. Um, and I felt uh, completely underqualified to do so. So I reached out to some um, uh, perhaps better placed uh, colleagues to try and, and help me to do that. Um, and so these are the, uh, the authors that have come together to, to prepare that book. It's, it's in publication at the moment, it's with Routledge and, and it's taking quite a lot of editing, perhaps longer than, than we would all like, but, it, but hopefully should be finished fairly soon. Um, so if I just take you through some of the chapters that we'll be able to read uh, when it's this published later this, this month. Um, uh, Dr. Amanda Spen is one of the world's leading researchers on the history of women in judo, and that's the title of her PhD, um, where, which is a biography of, of Sarah Maya, actually. Um, and uh, we've just heard from uh, Dr. Korach uh, and, and her She's done a chapter on teamwork as a way of governing in, in, in judo. And uh, that was picked up in Christina's presentation as well earlier on. Um, I had the audacity to write a chapter on uh, coaching women in judo. Um, I was fortunate enough to be mentored by one of the world's uh, leading coaches for, for women in judo, sadly passed away now. Um, uh, Dr. Jana Jans de Jong from uh, Australia is a judoka and she's written a chapter on physiological aspects uh, related to judo performance in women. Um, um, a current, uh, well, soon to be next, next week, uh, a second time Olympian, Natalie Powell collaborated with, with her coach, uh, Darren Warner on a, on a chapter on perspectives on technique and skill adaption. Um, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Allen, uh, EJ, um, RJF Executive um, Committee member, very, very busy lady, but um, managed to uh, support a chapter on competition judo for women. And, and I did a, a short chapter um, highlighting some profiles of, of um, some of the influential women that have, that have helped uh, raise, raise the profile over, over many years. So profiles on, on Rusty Kanakogi, Ingrid Bergman's, Kari Yamaguchi, Karen Briggs and, and Ryoko Tani. So that book hopefully will, um, well, it will come to publication uh, later this year. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, academic literature over the years uh, about women's judo. Um, I think uh, when, I, when I searched on Google Scholar, the term women and judo, I think it came up with over half a million uh, academic papers. Um, so uh, there's research going on at the moment, um, uh, for example, on the impact of, of judo on, on bone mineral density in, in postmenopausal women. Um, there's work, a lot of work going on in Brazil at the moment. Uh, this is some time motion uh, um, analysis, which has been led by uh, Bianca Miyaka. Uh, there's an um, example paper here from uh, Dr. Korach on, on analyzing the relevant factors about retaining women in judo. And that was something that, that, that um, uh, the Kosovan coach, uh, Tony, uh, mentioned as well. Then uh, Bianca again talking about the history of women's judo in Japan, and, and uh, that's a topic which has also been researched by uh, Mizuguchi Sensei. Um, this paper is an example of um, some, some work on gender dynamics. Um, and then we also have uh, a lot of work on physiology, uh, aerobic capacity, that kind of uh, 
physiological research. Um, and uh, there's one another example. I was a co-author on this one. Again, a, a time motion analysis looking in this particular case at 48, 52 and 57 kilos. Um, so uh, the academic literature is 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 well known. Um, and and our, our book um, hopefully will add to that and, and uh, help inform some, some of the policies that federations might be able to adopt as we move forwards. Um, so no doubt Jane is soon going to call Sora Made um, on, on my talk. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I think we're all looking forward to uh, getting our hands on the book when it's finally published. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we, we come to the end. I can see that any questions asked have been answered. Sandra, I saw you, you answered some questions. So that's a perfect uh, way to end. Um, I'd like to finish uh, before I thank everybody, will be to invite you next year um, to the, the Judo Festival, which of course, uh, anyway, we presume will not be online. Um, it's in Porec in Croatia, uh, usually in, in June. We will be publishing soon the dates on the EJU website, so keep your eyes open for that and um, book, book the date. Uh, uh, because the, um, the theme will be uh, gender equality. So I'm um, very apt that we're doing this at the moment. And so please think about coming and participating ne next year in the Judo Festival. Um, so thank you again for all our speakers. Um, really great to have all your experience, knowledge, and kind words of support and inspiration. And I hope that uh, we need to continue this work and making, as Sandra said, making the talk the walk. Uh, so from me, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I can tell that uh, the dream of our team is becoming the reality. Uh, we spoke a lot with my colleagues and uh, with the Federation presidents that we like to organize one event where we can combine all the activities which we can imagine in Judo. And this is the place. This is the place and this is the time when really different judo activities uh, we can meet together. And I think it is very positive because sometimes athletes are focused only in, on sport. Sometimes teacher coaches, they, they focus only on their pitching and only in kids. Sometimes people, they are going only for kata and for this. But when they meet together, I think they can really feel the atmosphere of judo, because judo is modern sport. So this is really our success and I believe that this year will, uh, it is more people here than was the previous years, but the next year will be sure much more. So this is our success, not of EGU, but this is success of European family, European judo family. So I can like to congratulate all coaches, all presidents, all athletes, all kids who are here 
and I recommend to all the others who are not here next year to come to visit this great festival, to, to visit this great Judah event. Oh,